Yeah, it's called First Snow. Yeah. Alright, this story's gonna be pretty brutal, so you should Wait, stick around you? for the funny one afterwards. Wait, Jesus, where are you? Yeah, what's with the headphones? You're the Googleplex. Why are you at the Googleplex? This is a repeat right. story. Pay attention the first time around. <laughs> I missed the Wait, wait, what happened? What? I submitted some code and it broke everything, so I stayed late to fix it. <laughs> oh no! Wait, uh, Google. Are you that once you're done with story time, you actually oh, yeah. go and like fix a bug that you broke. <laughs> no, I already fixed it, but That's I missed like my trouble. Oh, yeah, good right. job, good job fixing yeah, it. I found it. Hooray, Jesus didn't break Google. Yes, you can check Google and it will work, and it's all because of me. Oh yeah, stories. Yeah. First snow. What is first? Oh, this is last snow, hopefully, because it's been snowing for three days in Boulder. Or it's going to snow for three days straight in Boulder, starting yesterday. Dude, that yeah. sucks. Well, we just went to a beer tasting. I don't know if you can tell, but... I have not had any alcohol. Every week, you come from the same thing. <laughs> no, it's not it's true. different. It happens <laughs> once a month. Pay attention. <laughs> one of them happens once a month, the other one happens once a month. You just happen to miss all the ones that I wasn't there for. <laughs> two weeks out of the month where we're totally not drunk. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, two weeks yeah. there's improvised drunk instead of scheduled drunk. And well, I, he just I'm gets drunk, drunk but not because of a beer fest. Be responsible of our drunk. Wait, just shout out to the other drunk people. Are there any of you? Or don't know. No, I don't have any alcohol in my house. Why are you guys not drunk? What? Do you have work. alcohol in your house? Oh, you're yeah. Indian. Right. Indian woman don't drink. What? No, oh, that's beef. Come on. But, you know, oh, they don't eat beef, right? Dude. Actually, I do have some, but I'm saving it for Jesus. Your beer looks to be beef. They only drink smearing. Oh, yeah. How many cases of beer did you bring? No, I just brought the one growler. Growler? Oh, growler. Well, or what? Is bigger than that. Hey, what? Wait. Can you wait, 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 hold on, Gates. You have a growler or something? Yeah. That's totally sufficient. That's sixty-four ounces. Yeah, but it's saved for uh, next time I see Alex and Eric because it's from Santa Barbara. Who's Eric? Uh, uh, Alex and Eric. It wasn't fine. Hey, Who's Gates. Eric? Hello. Hello. Doesn't counter pressure feel? You should drink it sooner because growlers go bad really fast. If you yeah, I know, but it'll make it to. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, we have a board game night this week, so I figured it would make it. Nose. The nose. The nose. The nose has been replaced by an abstract oh, drawing. No. Right away. Part of Al will be played by a tall, dark, sinister, ugly man. Oh wow! Pete's like hiding in a corner. I didn't notice. Hi, Pete. Sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sarah's also hiding. That's Pete. Oh, the other person in the frame of the nose frame. Yeah, you didn't notice. Oh, me neither. I thought it was, <laughs> at first, I just thought it was like, um, like. Like moving back and forth really fast. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but then I realized it was a real person. Check it out. This is a juice box, if you can't really tell. I can't. Dude, can't. that is the coolest juice box ever. <laughs> Hells yeah. It has a joke in the back. How do you find a princess? Either show it to us or tell us. Is, is it a riddle or a joke? It's a joke. How do you find a princess? By looking in another castle. By what? With your penis compass. <laughs> How do you find a princess? Mm-hmm. Um, this is a pretty bad one. In a, by looking in a castle uh, with a king and a queen. That's right. Wrong. Damn it. You follow the footprints. Wow. Ha 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 ha. High quality juice box we got there, Manoj. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not a good one. Wait, maybe I can turn off my bandwidth throttling just for a tiny bit so you guys can see it. Yes. Oh! 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 You have to talk. Everyone be quiet. No, just click him. Yeah. Just click him and he'll... Oh. Well, clicking was hard. Whoa. 
It's a very nice shade of purple. No, that cannot apple possibly drink be a real brand of juice. Apple? <laughs> oh, I can the grape that. drink, Manoj. Iris, I'm putting your grape <laughs> drink on. Iris, you have hair sticking out everywhere. Like, <laughs> oh my god, that puppy's Iris, amazing. Your hair is fine. Dwang is just being weird. No, no, I just want more hairs to be sticking out. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah, sticking out hair. <laughs> All right. Wait, now it's actually go. just. Okay. Well, no. Yeah, Gates isn't a new woman. Um, I thought there was going to be a story. Wasn't there going to be a story? Oh, yes. Who's ready for a story? I want a story. Everybody. Excellent. You know what is raising your hand? And I don't see the animals in your frame. The woman in the blue shirt. What are you talking about? Girl. <laughs> 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 God damn it. <laughs> What just happened? The TARDIS just did something. <laughs> the <laughs> thing started <laughs> making noise. My TARDIS started making noise. I had to turn it off. You have a TARDIS? <laughs> I have like four TARDISes. Will you show me your four TARDISes, Gates? Well, one of them is right here. Oh, wait, we're reading a story, right? Ah, story. We need a story. <laughs> there. There's one of them. Them. With time travel, we can read as many stories as we like. Read your TARDISes. And the other ones aren't in the room, so no. Like a tarball? Like a cheap-dipped tarball? You know okay, silence. Let the stories begin. The story is entitled First Snow by Davy Rothbard. Oh, not by Rary Rover? No. I'm afraid he went with a more marketable name for strange reasons. Uh, and that makes no sense at all. You know, his original name is actually Rory Ruffer. Yep. I'm sure you read the Wikipedia article. Yes. A little known fact. Might have been vandalized, though. I don't know. Says the person who vandalized it. <laughs> and now it's, now it's on record, too. They're going to come after you. In a Wikipedia uh -oh. jail. All right. Oh Let's god! Go. Juice box all over my screen. <laughs> Minaj. Come on, Minaj. Those are made for children. How did you screw it up? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, just not a child. Only children know how to open those things. <laughs> All right, sorry. Continue. I will mute myself. Yeah, I really should judge him more fairly. All right, let us begin. Keely was complaining to me because she couldn't go kill crows today. So I sat and sympathized for a little while. That fall and on into winter, it was a joke among the five of us on our roadside crew. Something we'd say to cement the bonds between one another and keep Maurice safely outside our little circle. Colin, who was in for robbery, and who was, at 23, the oldest of us, and by far the most clever, came up with the catchphrase. It started one morning, as we rode in the back of the van on our way to a clean-up site, when Maurice said, Take one step toward Allah, and he'll take two steps toward you. When he spoke, we could never be sure if he was directing his words at us or talking to himself. So quiet was his voice, his gaze always set off to the side or down at his feet. The rest of us looked around at one another, sneering at this bit of wisdom so early in the day. In us, in anger still simmered, the anger of those who have been on the inside for only a couple of months, the anger of incredulity that someone would dare to take you away from your life and put you behind a 20-foot barbed wire fence. We were white. We were young. Allah was as much our friend as the cops who had taken us in. For three hours that morning, we picked up trash and rehearsed what we knew of proud silences and defiant expressions. Once or twice, a car zoomed past with a girl inside dark hair whipping in the wind, still parading a summer tan in her bikini top, even though by then it was late September and cold in Michigan. And we shouted after her and gave chase for a giddy half-second, 
before Grieger, the guard, brought us to a stop by raising his club. We had no doubt that he'd use it. Maurice worked on his own, a little bit away from us. At noon, we ate sandwiches in the back of the van. Grieger dozed up front with a newspaper over his face, a curtain of wire mesh and plexiglass dividing us. I don't know if Colin spent the entire morning cooking this up, or if he divined it in that moment, but once he finished his lunch, he entertained himself by faking sudden hard punches at Maurice. At each feigned blow, Maurice flinched and seemed to draw back further into himself. He was so mute and withdrawn, it was hard to tell when Colin spoke whether Maurice was ignoring him or simply didn't hear. Hey guys, I've got one for you, Colin said, looking around and gathering his audience, the way he always did before mm -hmm. delivering a line he knew we would prize. Check it out. You take one step toward Maurice, he takes two steps away from you. We all laugh. Maybe I laugh the loudest. I don't know. The laughter of men on the inside is sad and cruel. Joyous laughter, exuberance, exhilaration. These had no place in our lives at Galloway Lake Detention Center. I've been in a lot of places in the year since, and some of them were a lot worse. Dangerous, completely devoid of humor in any form. In some prisons, I've also seen, on occasion, a bright twinkle in the eye of some of the older guys that bordered on real merriment, but it was always followed with the same wistful and lost look. Every emotion can basically be experienced in two distinct ways, as felt in freedom and as felt in shackles. There is happiness behind bars, but it is always chained to something large and immovable. Anger, on the inside, has no place to go. Even loneliness and grief and loss cannot be felt as fully in prison as when you are free. At least for the five of us, targeting Maurice, laughing at his expense, suspended the monotony of our rage. The little quick breaths that came with our snickering seemed to relieve for a moment the pressure mounting inside us. We spent six mornings and afternoons a week along one 16-mile stretch of I-94, roaming the high, dry median weeds and the steep marshy embankments, picking up refuse, items so unwanted and vile that highway motorists couldn't bear to keep them in their cars until they reached a trash can at home. We filled hundreds of blue plastic bags with fast food wrappers and diapers, pop cans rattling with bees, jagged debris left from high-speed collisions. Weeks passed, and still the joke had not lost its luster. Take one step toward Maurice, Justin or Nick, or John Jay might say once we were back in the back of the van with the bags of garbage we'd collected that day. And we'd all crack up before they even finished. Maurice would stare ahead as if he was trying to fade into nothing. Sometimes he'd turn away. The joke gave a rhythm and shape to our days. Galloway Lake was not really even a prison, so much as a small work camp for first and second time serious offenders. For me, and for most of us, it was our first time inside, so when the air got colder and the leaves changed to yellow and orange and red, then to brown, and at last detached themselves and fell away, and we knew winter was on its way, a certain desperation latched onto our hearts. It's a peculiar sensation, that first change of seasons when you're locked up. You begin to understand that while time is frozen for you, it continues on for the rest of the world. Pain constricts your insides. There's an inescapable heat and ache at your temples. It becomes hard to breathe. I know all of us felt it, 
because our attacks on Maurice came with renewed viciousness and vigor. We never laid a hand on him. Greeter's presence prevented that, but we spat abuse in his face. I remember Nick was the most relentless. Nick told me once that I was. Through it all, I knew that Maurice had been chosen as our victim, not only because he was black and different from us in countless other ways, but because he was the weakest, and weakness, above all things, could not be tolerated. It is no defense, but I offer it as a fact. Had I been the weakest, they would have preyed on me. Maurice, though, Maurice was exceptionally weak. He was just a few inches over five feet, so slight as to resemble a child. He wore big glasses that he cleaned every few minutes by running spit on the thick lenses before drying them with a fold of his pant leg. Some guys retained a quiet dignity in backing away from confrontation. You had the sense that everything you said to them went unnoticed. Maurice, on the other hand, seemed to exist in a state of constant fear and agitation. He trembled at our approach. Insults stung him visibly. The only reason he did not retaliate was because he was so afraid. Thanksgiving passed, a cold holiday. We missed the turkey dinner because our van ran out of gas a mile from Galloway Lake and Greeter had a radio for another van. December came. And with it, gray skies and even colder days. Colin said that when it got too cold, they'd take us off highway cleanup and put us to work in the kitchen or in the laundry room. But all they did was issue us warmer outfits and gloves. In the colder weather, there was less trash, since tossing things to the roadside required people first to roll down their windows. Sometimes we'd stretch out in a wide semicircle, Maurice off to the side a little, Greeter watching us from the shoulder. We talk about football and girls we used to know, our eyes flickering over the flashes of passing traffic. I recall thinking once that to the people speeding by on their way to school or work in the morning or in the late afternoon heading home to their families, we must have appeared to be roadside garbage ourselves, littered across patches of grass where no person would ever think to rest. <coughs> it was one week before Christmas. It felt like there were cauldrons in our chests, ready to boil over. The morning was flat and dull gray and bitterly cold. And as we picked our way along the edge of the road toward the blank billboard at exit 150 that marked the end of one segment of cleanup, it began, without warning or fanfare, to snow. Fat, heavy flakes swept around us. We acknowledged this development wordlessly and kept on, crouching to scoop up a brown paper grocery bag or to grasp the long black rubber snake of a blown out tire. Hot diamonds of snow burned at my cheeks like tears and I rubbed them away before they could melt. At last, we climbed into the back of the van for lunch and it was then, with the winter's first snow touching softly against the back windows in the silence created by our disbelief and our madness at the sight of it, that Maurice, face buried in his hands, began to moan a little. He let out a sudden choked sob, and then, to our horror, sat up and began to speak to us, blurry-eyed and disoriented. None of y'all probably give a shit about me. I know that, he said. And I looked up at John Jay, expecting him to tell Maurice he was right. But John Jay and the rest of them were frozen by his voice. Last night, he went on, news came. They got me up out of my bunk. Then he paused 
and squeezed his eyes tight against some thought. Again, I waited for someone to interrupt him, to tell him he would not be heard. I don't know what he was working. I didn't know what he was working toward, but I wanted desperately for him to be quieted. See, my brother, he ain't mixed up in nothing. Now that's a good kid. Maurice's voice had a shaky, tremulous quality to it. After every few words, he took in a deep, staggered breath and then nodded to himself and forged on. My brother got good marks. My brother worked up at the, at the, up at Norton Pharmacy in the summertime. My brother, he'd come and visit me every week, every Thursday, as soon as he got off school. My brother, he run track too. Carl Lewis, that's what I call him. I say, Carl Lewis, you break the school record this week? I say, Carl Lewis, you hit in the books like I told you? Kid always had a head on his shoulders. Kid was like a math genius. He ain't never done dirt. I made him promise me that. I told him, Carl Lewis, you ain't ever coming in here like me. Kid had his shit together. Had himself a nice girl. Maurice teetered to one side like he was about to topple over, then righted himself. He took off his glasses, spit into the right hand, dabbed the thumb of his left hand into the saliva, and worked it in slow, tiny circles at the lenses. We must have watched him for five minutes. It is heavy now. My head was clouded. A hot emotion flooded me. I felt the blood push sluggishly through my body. Up front, barely audible, was Grieger's country music. A thick white blanket formed over the back windows. Maurice seemed to have collected himself, but after he had dried his glasses on his pants with numb difficulty and replaced them over his eyes, he began all at once to cry. Chaplin came last night and told me what happened is, what he says is, what he told me, Chaplin said, your brother's dead. He wailed at the sound of his own voice, presenting the information. He got done in, never meant no one no harm, but they done him in on accident, done in from Marcus Eddy next door. Now he was really hysterical. Not a one of us moved or spoke. I was dead inside. Blackness filled me, a bolt of nausea. Something in my core threatened to break apart, and I strained to keep it intact. Maurice cried harder, and he kept crying things out. I can't go see him, he gasped, gripping his head with his baby hands, still sitting straight. I just want to see him. But they put him in the ground. They put him in the ground. They put him in the ground. Shut the fuck up. I heard someone say, slowly and evenly. And then I realized the voice was mine. Maurice kept on, and I said it again. A space between each word, as though they were four separate commands. Shut the Fuck up. But by that point, he was beyond us in his misery. He cried on for his brother and for himself. I want to go home, he wailed. I want to go home. I want to see my brother. They put him in the ground. It's snowing. God, it's snowing. <laughs> Tears not flowing through his lovely lips. The van started up at that moment, and Greeter swung us up onto the road. The back end slid a little in the fresh snow. We drove for three minutes to another spot. Maurice whimpered and struggled for breath. 
As Greeter came around the back of the van to let us out, I shouted at Maurice so loud it shook him from his stupor. You! The breath caught him in his throat. His eyes came into focus. Now shut the fuck up, I told him. What happened next is a little hard to piece together because it was so unexpected and because it all happened so fast. First, the back door swung open and I saw Greeter plainly against the falling slow, a hard, balding man of 50 years, 30 years of which he'd spent in corrections. Okay, everyone out, he said. He never bore resentment toward any of us as long as he made his job easy and behave. The car that hit him seemed to come from nowhere. One moment, the road behind the greeter was empty, and the next, a wide black Buick was flying sideways at all of us. It struck greeter and then the van. The impact tossed us in a heap on the floor. I remember next only that we were all standing outside the van. Colin, Nick, Oh, Justin, John J., Maurice, and I. And that greeter was crumpled in the snow like a flattened pop can. And that the Buick's tires were spinning like mad on the shoulder. The tires finally grabbed the pavement, and the Buick shot away and disappeared into the curtain of whiteness. Already, snow had begun to accumulate over greeter's legs, his back, and his arms. The six of us stared dumbly at one another. Here it was, a chance for escape. The keys had burrowed in a place in the snow a few inches from Greeter's hand. We could be miles away before anyone ever knew what happened. But our time at Galloway Lake was nearly half over. Running made no sense. They would catch us again, and this time they'd keep us in for longer. In our minds, we had only a few months to go, and then we would be free. Had Maurice remained silent, the next part of it might have gone differently. My glasses, he said to nobody, groping blindly toward the ground. Where are my glasses? John Jay toward, turned toward him and made this odd sound, a kind of low, and disapproving hum, and launched himself at Maurice, ramming him with his shoulder, with his forearm and shoulder. Maurice crashed to the earth and lay there stunned for half a second, staring blankly up, staring up into the blank sky before John Jay landed on him, flailing his fists, crying, stupid nigger, stupid nigger, stupid nigger. Then all of us were around Maurice, dragging him, and carrying him to the side of the van, out of sight of the infrequent passing cars. He never raised a hand up in defense. He never had the chance. Two of us held Maurice by his shoulders up against the van while we took turns battering him. We hit him with our elbows and with our fists. We kicked at him. We spit on him and shouted things. All the while, the snow fell. Giant snowflakes stuck in our hair. Maurice's blood was pink on our hands and on our uniforms. The madness of it brought great, wild smiles to our faces. We danced strange jigs and yelped and sang. It seemed as if our whole lives had been lived in preparation for this celebration. We beat Maurice savagely, with pride, with glory. That's the after a long, long time, we had expended ourselves. We stood apart from one another. Maurice lay bloodied and broken halfway beneath the van. John Jay stared out toward the bare trees of the birch woods before us. Nick caught snowflakes on his outstretched palm. Justin watched the road. Presently, Colin broke away and went over to Greeter's motionless form. Hey guys, 
Ellen said vacantly. He's pretty bad, messed up. We better get him to a hospital. John Jay grunted in agreement, and the two of them lifted Greeter gently into the back of the van. He was still breathing. John Jay climbed in beside him and tried to comfort him. Nick and Justin joined John Jay. I sorted through the spiny ball of keys for the one to the driver's door, got up in front, and reached over to unlock the far side for Colin. He got in, and then, as an afterthought, we both got out and pulled Maurice from under the van and put him in back with the others. I started the van, crossed the eastbound lanes, bumped over the grassy median, and headed west toward Jackson and the hospital there in the snowstorm. Already my mind had recoiled from the beating. It occurred to me in my days, as I leaned forward in the seat, flipped on the lights and the wipers, and fought to keep the van from fishtailing while still driving as quickly as I could, that just a few hours before it had been autumn, late autumn, but not yet winter, and that now it was winter. I became dimly aware that I would be freed in the spring. Oh, if I became dimly aware that although I would be freed in the spring, it would not be long before I was locked up again. And that realization hurt me worse than anything. I knew also that the only way I could have avoided this future of a lifetime of incarceration was if immediately after the accident we had grouped up and gone for help, or if right away we had attempted escape. Escape would have been impossible, but flight would have substituted for what had just transpired, that terrible release, which I could not in that moment, or for many years, remember. The end. Yay. That was really sad. Yep, that was the ultra depressing story. Aww. But we have a happy, funny one to follow. Yay. So we'll get a well, nice mix of both. I mean, why not, right? <laughs> you just look a little sad note. I have to go do something. Thanks for making me but I figure we need to balance everything out. So, some little stories, some philosophical stories. No! Stories. No! Let's keep a story about fire. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna have to leave. Hey, you. You're missing the good one, man. Oh no, why didn't you should we get that one first? <laughs> It's a treat for the people who are dedicated. <laughs> I'll just watch the YouTube video later. Or for people like Chelsea who just show up late. Hey, yeah. what's up? Like, you got the right strategy. Dude, I'm in like balls deep in finals and projects and shit. You just said balls deep in finals? Balls yeah. deep in finals, eh? There's balls deep in finals in a library or wherever the hell you are. Let's I'm in a, a lounge in the cathedral for me. That explains it. You're really echoing. You're like, the cathedral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The cathedral of blood. <laughs> hey, Chelsea, can you pretend to be God for a second? What? Pretend to be God. Say something that God would say. Everyone look at my dog. Oh my god. I, I don't dog. know what God would say. <laughs> the dog is upside down. She's been lying like that for a long time. <laughs> you take pictures, probably. My phone died. Oh, no. Well, it's being recorded forever. Cute. Alrighty, goodbye, guys. <laughs> Peace. Goodbye, okay, guys. I'm going to mute myself again and seriously code. That was a God voices. He's like, hello, this is God. <laughs> I am the Lord, your God. Yeah, but we're not echoing like her.
I am the Lord your God. <laughs> okay, I don't want to, like, this is ridiculous. Seriously, I have to do work. Just read to me. <laughs> Alright, good plan. Let's go to our second story. So, this story is entitled, We Can Get Them For You Wholesale, by Neil Gaiman. Is it Gaiman? Oh, I've heard this story. This story's good. Ah, Hey, would anybody like to write more collaborative stories? Yes. Because we should do that. Yeah, I started thinking about a reasonable plot. It's tough. I have a lot of ideas floating around. It's hard to pick the best one. Excellent. This is kind of an idea, man. No, I agree. I, I think we should do like shorter chapters, like, like mini 500 word chapters, because that would really help motivate people maybe a little more. You know, only 500 words. That's easy. Yeah, that makes sense. Because we know everybody here turned in a finale chapter. Uh huh. Well, some people are just too much of a slacker to do anything whatsoever. Well, we have to accept that. Yeah, but those people are bad people. And it's like the I'm sorry that I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> well, just say it louder and more godlike to make up for it. More godlike. More godlike. Jesus, I'm a piece of shit. Hold on, wait. This will be good, guys. Shut up. I'm sorry, I'm a piece of shit. No, say it like God. Deeper, like just. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> that wasn't like God, though. Hold on, let me try again. Festival. <laughs> I am sorry that I have a piece of shit. There we go. Is that more godlike. Yeah. yeah by the way, this is like recording. <laughs> Why are you doing this? <laughs> Don't worry, we couldn't see his eyes. He's basically anonymous. We'll never get back. Unless he's using hands, you know. Yeah, uncrop. Yeah, uncrop. You gotta watch out for that. It's tricky. Alright, let's begin story number two. We can get them for you wholesale. Peter Pinter had never heard of Aristippus of the Cyrenaics, a lesser-known follower of Socrates, who maintained that the avoidance of trouble was the highest attainable good. However, he had lived his uneventful life according to this precept. In all respects except one, an inability to pass up a bargain, and which of us is entirely free from that, he was a very moderate man. He did not go to extremes. His speech was proper and reserved. He rarely overate. He drank enough to be sociable and no more. He was far from rich and in no ways poor. He liked people, and people liked him. Bearing all that in mind, would you expect to find him in a low-life pub on the seamier side of London's East End, taking out what is colloquially known as a contract on someone he hardly knew? You would not. You would not even expect to find him in the pub. And until a certain Friday afternoon, you would have been right. But the love of this woman can do strange things to a man, even one so colorless as Peter Pinter. And the discovery that Miss Gwendolyn Thorpe, 23 years of age, of Nine Oak Tree Terrace, Hurley, was messing about, as the vulgar would put it, with a smooth young gentleman from the accounting department after, mark you, she had consented to wear an engagement ring composed of real ruby chips, nine carat goat, and something that might well have been a diamond, 37 pounds 50, that it had taken Peter almost an entire lunch hour to choose, well, that can do very strange things to a man, indeed. After he made this shocking discovery, Peter spent a sleepless Friday night tossing and turning with visions of Gwendolyn and Archie Gibbons, the Don Juan of the 
Calamunge, Clamages, the county department, dancing and swimming before his eyes, performing acts that even Peter, if he were pressed, would have to admit were most improbable. But the bile of jealousy had risen up within him, and by the morning Peter had resolved that his rival should be done away with. Saturday morning was spent wondering how one contacted an assassin, for, to the best of Peter's knowledge, none were employed by the Clamages, the department store that employed all three of the members of our eternal triangle, and, incidentally, furnished the ring. And he was wary of asking anyone outright, for fear of attracting attention to himself. And thus it was that Saturday afternoon found him hunting through the yellow pages. Assassins, he found, was not between asphalt contractors and assessors. Killers was not between kennels and kindergartens. <coughs> Murderers was not between mowers and museums. Pest control looked promising. However, closer investigation of the pest control advertisements showed them to be almost solely concerned with rats, mice, fleas, cockroaches, rabbits, moles, and rats. To quote from one that Peter felt was rather hard on rats. And not really what he had in mind. Even so, being of a careful nature, he dutifully inspected the entries in that category, and at the bottom of the second page, in small print, he found a firm that looked promising. Complete discreet disposal of irksome and unwanted mammals, etc., went the entry. Catch Hare, Burke, and Catch, the old firm. It went on to give no address, but only a telephone number. Peter dialed the number, surprising himself by so doing. His heart pounded in his chest, and he tried to look nonchalant. The telephone rang once, twice, three times. Peter was just starting to hope that it would not be answered, and he could forget the whole thing when there was a click, and a brisk young female voice said, Catch hair, Burke, and catch. May I help you? Careful not, carefully not giving up his name, Peter said. Er, how big, I mean, what size mammals do you go up to? To, uh, dispose of? Well, that would all depend on what size sir requires. He plucked up his courage. A person? Her voice remained brisk and unruffled. Of course, sir. Do you have a pen and paper handy? Good. Be at the Dirty Donkey Pub off Little Courtney Street, E3, tonight at 8 o'clock. Carry a rolled up copy of the Financial Times. That's the pink one, sir, and our operative will approach you there. Then she put down the phone. Peter was elated. It had been far easier than he had imagined. He went down to the news agents and bought a copy of the Financial Times, found Little Courtney Street in his AZ of London, and spent the rest of the afternoon watching football on the television and imagining the smooth young gentleman from accounting's funeral. It took Peter a while to find the pub. Eventually, he spotted the pub sign which showed a donkey, and was, indeed, remarkably dirty. The Dirty Donkey was a small and more or less filthy pub, poorly lit, in which knots of unshaven people wearing dusty donkey jackets stood around, eyeing each other suspiciously, eating crisps and drinking pints of Guinness, a drink that Peter had never cared for. Peter held his financial times under one arm as conspicuously as he could, but no one approached him. So he bought a half of shandy and retreated to a corner table. Unable to think of anything else to do while waiting, he tried to read the paper, but lost and confused by a maze of grain futures and a rubber company that was selling something or other short, quite what the short somethings were, he could not tell. He gave it up and stared at the door. 
He had waited almost ten minutes when a small, busy man hustled in, looked quickly about him, then came straight over to Peter's table and sat down. He stuck out his hand. Kimball, Burton Kimball of Catch Hair Burton Catch. I hear you have a job for us. He didn't look like a killer. Peter said so. Oh, Lord, bless us, no. I'm not actually a part of our workforce, sir. Workforce, sir. I'm in sales. Peter nodded. That certainly made sense. Can we, er, uh, talk freely here? Sure. Nobody's interested. Now then, how many people would you like disposed of? Only one. His name's Archibald Gibbons. Eddie works in Plumage's accounting department. His address is... Kimball interrupted. We can go into all that later, sir, if you don't mind. Let's just quickly go over the financial side. First of all, the contract will cost you 500 pounds. Peter nodded. He could afford that, and in fact, had expected to pay a little more. Although there's always this special offer. Kimball concluded smoothly. <laughs> Peter's eyes shone. As I mentioned earlier, he loved to bargain, and often bought things he had no imaginable use for in sales or on special offers. Apart from this one failing, one so many of us share, he was a most moderate young man. Special offer? Two for the price of one, sir. Hmm. Peter thought about it. That worked out with only 250 pounds each, which couldn't be bad, no matter how you looked at it. There was only one snag. I'm afraid I don't have anyone else I want killed. <laughs> Kimball looked disappointed. Well, that's a pity, sir. For two, we probably could have even dropped the price down to, well, say 450 pounds for the both of them. Really? Well, it gives our operative something to do, sir, if you must know. <laughs> and here, he dropped his voice. There really isn't enough work in this particular line to keep him occupied. It's not like the old days. Isn't there just one other person you'd like to see dead? Peter pondered. He hated to pass up a bargain, but couldn't for the life of him think of anyone else. He liked people. Still, a bargain was a bargain. <laughs> Look, said Peter, could I think about it and see you here tomorrow night? The salesman looked pleased. Of course, sir, he said. I'm sure you'll be able to think of someone. The answer, the obvious answer, came to Peter as he was drifting off to sleep that night. He sat straight up in bed, fumbled the bedside light up, on, and wrote a name down on the back of an envelope in case he forgot it. To tell the truth, he didn't think he could forget it, for it was painfully obvious. But you can never tell with these late-night thoughts. The name he had written down on the back of the envelope was this. Gwendolyn Thorpe. He turned the light off rolled over, and was soon asleep, dreaming peaceful and remarkably unmurderous dreams. <laughs> Kimball was waiting for him when he arrived in the dirty donkey on Sunday night. Peter bought a drink and sat down beside him. I'm taking you up on the special offer, he said by way of greeting. Kimball nodded vigorously. A very wise decision, if you don't mind me saying so, sir. Um, Peter Pinter smiled modestly, in the manner of one who reads the Financial Times and made very wise business decisions. That will be 450 pounds, I believe. Did I say 450 pounds, sir? Good gracious me, I do apologize. I beg your pardon. I was thinking of our bulk rate. That would be 475 for two people. Disappointment mingled with cupidity. 
on Peter's bland and youthful, youthful face. That was an extra 25 pounds. However, something that Kimball had said caught his attention. Bulk rate? Of course, but I doubt Sir would be interested in that. No, no I am. Tell me about it. <laughs> Very well, Sir. A bulk rate, 450 pounds, would be for a large job, 10 people. <laughs> Peter wondered if he had heard correctly. 10 people? That's only 45 pounds each. Yes, sir. It's the large order that makes it profitable. <laughs> I see, said Peter, and, hmm, said Peter, and, could you be here at the same time tomorrow night? <laughs> of course, sir. Upon arriving home, Peter got out a scrap of paper and a pen. He wrote the numbers 1 to 10 down on one side, and then filled it in as follows. 1. Archie. 2. Gwenny. 3. And so forth. Having filled in the first two, he sat sucking his pen, hunting for wrongs done to him and people the world would be better off without. He smoked a cigarette. He strolled around the room. Aha! There was a physics teacher at the school he had attended who had delighted in making his life a misery. What was that name? His name again? And for that matter, Tommy. Was he still alive? Tommy. <laughs> Hi, Tommy. Oh, man. We've got a Tommy. Tommy, do you like murdering? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tommy is an avid murderer. Tommy, we can't hear you. Your microphone is muted. Speak louder. <laughs> what? Can't hear you. Speak up, son. Go to unmute, man. Top right corner. Wait, here. You know, now, now that we're all interrupting the story, who is the half a head that's in your face? No, I'm just I'm Hi. <laughs> it was Hi. really strange not to be a face ever. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, Tommy. Is that, is that bed underneath Fiona? No. This okay. Tom, you do realize this thing starts an hour earlier, don't you? Or are you just confused? Oh, um, well, not really, no. And I do. <laughs> hey. All right, for future reference. Tommy, you're uh, late to class. Um, what did I miss? <laughs> well. Give me notes. Tommy, do you like bargains? <laughs> <laughs> Well, come here next time, and I'll give you two stories for the price of one. Uh, what's the price of one? I can't tell you that until you come next time. How do I know I'm not getting ripped off? Well, you don't, but you just have to trust me. Don't I look trustworthy? No. Not really. No. Well, you just have to shop around, join other hangouts, and see how many stories they will give you. <laughs> Our prices cannot be beat. Jesus is the story executor. I'm just a, I'm just a salesman. Yeah, I've got a pretty sweet marketing department. Doing a better job at selling. Thanks. You know, my computer's like dying. Something. Uh, is there like another story going on now? Yes, we should return. Back to the story. Let's see, where was I? Ah, oh, yes. Aha! There was a physics teacher at the school he had attended who had delighted in making his life a misery. What was that man's name again? And for that matter, was he still alive? Peter wasn't sure, but he wrote, The Physics Teacher, 
Abbott Street Secondary School, next to the number three. The next came more easily. His department head had refused to raise his salary a couple months back. That the raise had eventually come was immaterial. Mr. Hutchinson was number four. When he was a boy, when he was five, a boy named Simon Ellis had poured paint on his head, while another boy named James Somebody or Other had held him down, and a girl named Sharon Harsharp had laughed. They were numbers five through seven, respectively. Who else? There was a man on television with the annoying snicker who read the news. He went on the list. <laughs> and what about that woman in the flat next door with the little yappy dog who shat in the hall? He put her and the dog down on nine. <laughs> Ten was the hardest. He scratched his head and went into the kitchen for a cup of coffee, then dashed back and wrote, My great uncle Mervyn, down in the tenth place. The old man was rumored to be quite affluent, and there was a possibility albeit rather slim, that he could leave Peter some money. With the satisfaction of an evening's work well done, he went off to bed. Monday at Clamish's was routine. Peter was a senior sales assistant in the books department, a job that entailed, actually entailed, very little. He clutched his lips tightly in his hand, deep in his pocket, rejoicing in the feeling of power that it gave him. He spent a most enjoyable lunch hour in the canteen with young Gwendolyn, who did not know he had seen her and Archie entering the stock room together. And he even smiled at the smooth young man from the accounting department when he passed him in the corridor. He proudly displayed his list to Kimball that evening. The little salesman's face fell. I'm afraid this isn't ten people, Mr. Penter, he explained. You've counted the woman in the next door flat and her dog as one person. That brings it to eleven, which would be an extra... His pocket calculator was rapidly deployed. An extra seventy pounds. How about if we forget the dog? Peter shook his head. The dog's as bad as the woman, or worse. Then I'm afraid we have a slight problem. Unless... What? Unless you'd like to take advantage of our wholesale rate. But of course, sir, <laughs> wouldn't be. There are words that do things to people. Words that make people's faces flush with joy, excitement, or passion. Environmental can be one. Occult is another. Wholesale was Peter's. <laughs> he leaned back in his chair. Tell me about it, he said with the practiced assurance of an experienced shopper. Well, sir, said Kimball, allowing himself a little chuckle. We can, um, get them for you wholesale. Seventeen pounds fifty each. For every quarry up to the first fifty. Or a tenner each. For every one over two hundred. <laughs> I suppose you'd go down to a fiver if I wanted a thousand people locked off? Oh, no, sir. Kimball looked quite shocked. If you're talking those sorts of figures, we could do them for a quid each. <laughs> One pound? <laughs> That's right, sir. There's not a big profit margin on it, but the high turnover and productivity more than justifies it. <laughs> Kimball got up. Same time tomorrow, sir? Peter nodded. One thousand pounds. One thousand people. Peter Pinter didn't even know a thousand people. Even so, there were the Houses of Parliament. He didn't like politicians. They squabbled and argued and carried on so. And for that matter, an idea shocking in its audacity bold, daring. Still, the idea was there, and it wouldn't go away. 
A distant cousin of his had married the younger brother of an earl or baron or baron or something. On the way home from work that afternoon, he stopped off at a little shop that he had passed a thousand times without entering. It had a large sign in the window, guaranteeing to trace your lineage for you, and even draw up a coat of arms if you happen to have mislaid your own, and an impressive heraldic map. Maybe now that the darkness had lifted from her mind, all she wanted was to be with family again. They were very helpful, and phoned him up just after seven to give him their news. If approximately 14 million... 72,811 people died, he, Peter Pinter, would be King of England. <laughs> he didn't have 14,072,811 pounds, but he suspected that when you were talking in those figures, Mr. Kimball would have one of his special discounts. <laughs> Mr. Kimball did. He didn't even raise an eyebrow. Actually, he explained, it works out quite cheaply. You see, we wouldn't have to do them all individually. Small-scale nuclear weapons, some judicious bombing, gassing, plague, dropping radios in swimming pools, and then mopping up the stragglers. Say... Four thousand pounds. Four th that's incredible! The salesman looked pleased with himself. Our operatives will be glad of the work, sir, he grinned. We pride ourselves in surfacing our wholesale customers. <coughs> the wind blew cold as Peter left the pub, setting the old sign swinging. It didn't look much like a dirty donkey, thought Peter more like a pale horse. Peter was drifting off to sleep that night, mentally rehearsing his coronation speech, when a thought drifted into his head and hung around. It would not go away. Could he... Could he possibly be passing up an even larger saving than he already had? Could he be missing out on a bargain? Peter climbed out of bed and walked over to the phone. It was almost 3 a.m., but even so, his yellow pages lay open where he had left it the previous Saturday, and he dialed the number. The phone seemed to ring forever. There was a click, and a bored voice said, Burke, Hare, Catch, can I help you? I hope I'm not phoning too late, he began. Of course not, sir. I was wondering if I could speak to Mr. Kimball. Can you hold? I'll see if he's available. Peter waited for a couple of minutes, listening to the ghostly crackles and whispers that always echo down empty phone lines. Are you there, caller? Yes, I'm here. What are you through? There was a buzz, then. Kimball speaking. Ah, Mr. Kimball. Hello. Sorry if I got you out of bed or anything. This is, um, Peter Pinter. Yes, Mr. Pinter. Well, I'm sorry it's so late. Only I was wondering, how much would it cost to kill everybody? Everybody in the world? Everybody. All the people? Yes, how much? I mean, for an order like that, you'd have to have some kind of big discount. How much would it be? For everyone. <laughs> Nothing at all, Mr. Pinter. You mean you wouldn't do it? I mean, we'd do it for nothing, Mr. Pinter. We only have to be asked, you see? We always have to be asked. Peter was puzzled. But when would you start? Start? Right away. Now. We've been ready for a long time. 
But we had to be asked, Mr. Pinter. Good night. It has been a pleasure doing business with you. <coughs> the line went dead. Peter felt strange. Everything seemed very distant. He wanted to sit down. What on earth had the man meant? We always have to be asked. It was definitely strange. Nobody does anything for nothing in this world. He had a good mind to phone Kimball back and call the whole thing off. Perhaps he had overreacted. Perhaps there was a perfectly innocent reason why Archie and Gwendolyn had entered the stockroom together. He would talk to her. That's what he'd do. He'd talk to Gwenny first thing tomorrow morning. That was when the noises started. Odd cries from across the street. A cat fight? Boxes, probably. He hoped someone would throw a shoe at them. Then, from the corridor outside his flat, he heard a muffled clumping, as if someone were dragging something very heavy along the floor. It stopped. Someone knocked on his door, twice, very softly. Outside his windows, the cries were getting louder. Peter sat in his chair, knowing that somehow, somewhere, he had missed something. Something important. The knocking redoubled. He was thankful that he always locked and chained his door at night. They had been ready for a long time, but they had to be asked. When the thing came through the door, Peter started screaming. But he really didn't scream for very long. The end. <laughs> that was a very strange story. <laughs> That was one of my favorite Neil Gaiman stories. Yeah, that was really good. <laughs> so ridiculous. I knew I had to end with that. It's the clear <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent. Murder double feature. Hey, nobody died in the first one. Well, it was well, a much more peaceful story. <laughs> in fact, everybody died in the last one. Well, but it was hilarious, so it was okay. It was hilarious. If everybody in the world died right now, but it was hilarious, it'd probably be fine. Uh -oh. You had okay trade off. I mean, I mean, it had to be really hilarious, like. Oh, well. well, that was a good story. Thank you for reading. Yep. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. You are too kind. Tommy, did you just discover all the Google things that you could? No. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm still getting news of these, so like the next two hangouts that happened that I've done. By the way. What? I'm going to be amused with these, like the next two hangouts. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. actually ever get old. Oh, None of us have put on any hats this time, though. Did you notice that? Oh, well, we can fix that. <laughs> no, we were so close to a hatless hangout. Why break it now? Well. <laughs> Oh dear. We were so close. Should have just kicked you wing out when I had the chance. <laughs> Why would you do that? Well, I had expected Tommy to be the one with the hat, so I called it right. That doesn't work very well. I could be King of England. There we go. Okay. Only 4,000 pounds. Good deal. Yeah, this one.
degenerating. <laughs> You know, it's late at night. Everyone's delirious from sleepiness. Really? Who's farting? Is that Gates? It's all of Gates. Gates is always farting. Gates has decided the fart is the only sound worth playing. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fart. <laughs> oh god. What have we become? He yeah. says no shame. I'm sure I can make a song out of it. I'm sure you will try. <laughs> you could, but will you? I dig it. <laughs> All right. <There> you go. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like the first time we discovered them again. I never, I never, never get old. No short term memory. It's <laughs> a really bad one. My bad, sir. They need to make it so the longer you hold the button down, the longer it goes. So like the fart could just go... Now, we need to avoid that as much as possible. <laughs> I, think I it would personally be delete the code if they implement that. <laughs> Thing that we drew on last time that I was in this like chat. Scoot and Google. Scoot and Doodle. Scoot and Doodle. I think I'm going to go to sleep now. That's ridiculous. What a silly thing to You're say. Ridiculous. You're ridiculous. No. Yes. Maybe not just you. Truly, shockingly ridiculous. Nope, nope, nope. Okay. Hey, good to have you back, Fiona, after your long hiatus. My computer works now. It's not ex super extra exciting. Yay! Amazing. I don't know, I still don't know what was wrong with it, but it's better now. All right, keep it up, and see you next week. Bye. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Oh, you missed Fiona's leaving. Was it amusing in any way? It was oh. heartfelt. No, nobody cares. Nobody even remembered to play a silly sound for it. That's too bad. So, what do we do now? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. Yep, let's start with the phone book. Start with what? The phone book. Uh, 
hey, Tommy, would you be interested in writing, like, a short chapter for a collaborative story? Okay, what does that entail? Writing a short chapter for a collaborative story. All right. What's the story about? I don't know. It's not been decided yet. That's what we're working on. Am I doing, like, an intermediate chapter, then? Do I need to know any of the characters? Yeah, I'll give you a prompt that you can work from. All right. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Did you do do it. It? We wrote a story. Alright, I'll add a chapter. Yeah, but I mean, no, we're, we're gonna start a new story sometime. It'll be great. Let me get rid of these. Oh, uh, Eric, Eric uh, said he would let for writing some um, stuff. Except for the monocle. The Eric who lives here now, I guess. Well, he's been couching for like three months, so. He's a new resident at this point. Well, he already sort of paid us uh, like for some groceries and like a little bit for his staying there, so. Hey, so when is everyone going to the carnival in San Francisco thing? Is everyone going in on Saturday? I'm going on Friday. I'm already here, so there's that. Hey, Tommy, are you going? Man, you look early to the party. Tommy, are you going? Yeah, I uh, haven't booked the tickets yet, and I need what? to. What? That's so What's wrong with you? I'm going to do it tomorrow. I need to talk to my advisor. You better get on that. I'm probably going to have a plan like on Wednesday or Thursday, and only stay till Sunday. Oh man, that's fine. Well, probably do Wait, Tommy, are you flying in on um, like the 26th or something, or whenever that is? I'm probably going to come in on like halfway through the week. <laughs> on, like, the, oh, okay, yeah, I had to switch mine to the week after because I have like a ton of work I have to turn in before Wait, the Wait, you're going to Carnival for the yeah. week after? What? Why is there so much of an echo with your voice? Because I'm in some like lounge. I'm also a god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. And basically, she's gone, yeah. Alright, wait, so you're coming the week after everyone's going? Yeah, I, I, there's like just no way I could have gone earlier, and plus, um, my sister had some time off and she also wants to go. So it's actually gonna, like, she wants to, like, go around and see stuff. And yeah. I, like, never get to see her anymore, so I kinda wanna have a trip that she can come on. Lots of station in Boulder last year that I went back on. What? That's what I did in Boulder. But I don't think I'm coming at all to San Francisco. That's cool. Yes. Uh, what just happened? Hmm. <sighs> I'll, I'll let you know when I buy the tickets, though. Yeah, you should hurry up. That might be something you want to get on. I, I realize the ticket price is getting pretty high. I don't know, this is a sad face. Ugh. Ugh. Stop with the faces. Old, terrible. Hey! Yeah, I'll fix it. There we go. I can still see it. I can't see it. I can see it even more now. Haha, <laughs> 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 magnificent. Uh oh. Uh oh. Capture messes up people's cameras. Like, Chelsea's camera's gone now. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Hey, you're back for that button. Why are we doing this? We want things to be weird. What happened to Jesus? What the fuck? Why is Jesus? Wow. Like, he's like an abstract clown. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> terrifying. I will eat your soul. <laughs> That's just awful. How do I change the low res? I haven't figured it out yet. Well, it's very simple. There's some bars, and you make them have less bars. Oh, I found it. 
you make it too low, <laughs> there's no image whatsoever. Audio only. Wait, where is this? Where is it? I want to know. Yeah, where is it? Top right corner. Looks like a cell phone. Bye. Bye. You want to do the uh, second setting for the left to make it interesting. Is it in the hangout toolbox? No, it's built into the main window. It's to the left of the gear, to the right of the turn off camera sign. In the top right corner. To the left of the gear? Mm -hmm. That's adjust bandwidth. Correct. That's right. Uh, I thought it'd be like an edge detector. Yeah, it's basically like an edge detector. Oh, that's how it compresses them. That's like I don't know that. I don't know how to send a lot of data. My eyebrows look kind of crazy. <laughs> yes, they do. Ready? It's kind of weird. Where'd everyone go? <laughs> Getting bored and running away. So he has some social skills to say goodbye. What the hell? What was that nonsense? Kelsey has some pretty lively background sounds. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like watching a video. She's in a zoo, actually. <laughs> it's her pet elephant. <laughs> wants to be fed. Yes, put it on camera. I'll say I like your earrings. Thanks. I also like your. <laughs> I also like your voice of God. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so when do your finals end, Chelsea? Will you be full of free time by next Tuesday? By next Tuesday? No. my I have two finals next Wednesday, but I have, like... A bunch. I have two projects due, and then I have to do the demonstrations later that week, and then like, yeah. Mm. Yep, it's gonna be rough then. Yeah. Sorry guys, my internet broke. Jeez, Tommy, get it together. Get it together, man. <laughs> Where did you hang up? He was eaten by a pirate. That's exactly what happened. Getting more alcohol is the answer 95% of the time. Yeah, we still have a story time drinking game. Get on that. Every time Jesus reads a sentence, take a drink. We're on the ventilation. That would be the most impressive <laughs> drinking game. Every time Jesus makes Q Wang laugh, take a drink. <laughs> Alright, gotta find the funniest stories ever. 
Every time someone uses the toolbox fart noise, take a drink. I think only you have to drink for that. What? <laughs> Stacey, are you there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you, is your camera off or are you just sitting in the pitch black? Wait, my camera's not off. I can see both of you guys. Yeah, I can see. Shit, am I the only person who can't see her? No, yeah. real time. I blocked myself from you. <laughs> <laughs> Stacy just said hi to you. Stacy just said hi to you. Hey, Stacy. I can't see you because you're very really small. No, she's that's her. The, uh, well, the I can't. Then I, even, I can't see because you. Because she hates us. I hate you, so I made you. Made I used to be like It's pretty cool. I still haven't seen you clap your ass. Hurry, clap your ass. You don't have to do it now. It's okay. <laughs> no pressure. Oh. Uh, okay, I gotta go. I will see you guys later. Uh, good to have you. So, anyone seen any good movies lately? There's a new uh, preview for that Superman movie that's coming out. It looks pretty good. Oh, uh, yeah, I saw that. I, I think that movie will be good. I hope it doesn't suck. I thought the Dark Knight's pretty good, so hopefully that means something. For yeah, movie. that's true. Oh, is Christopher Nolan directing it? No, but he's oh, yeah. like in a producing something. role. Zack Snyder's directing it. Okay. Zack Snyder's pretty good. 300, Watchmen. Yeah. And Other movies directed by Zack Snyder. Too. I think it will do okay. And I'm also excited for Star Trek. Oh yeah, that's going to be really good. Hopefully. Yeah. I All saw... All the movies I've seen lately have been terrible. Like The Sheriff or whatever the last fan was. Or the uh, one. <laughs> that looks terrible. I, I want saw... to see it though. I saw G.I. Joe with my brother, and it was really stupid. What? I got twice through you the first one. Oh, uh, I mean, it was... I, felt, I, like, rented the first one and fell asleep, so I don't even really remember it. But the second one, I just remember the first one was awful. But the second one was, like, stupid and retarded, but it was still, it was still fun. Like, The Rock blew a bunch of shit up, and it was really fun to watch. The uh, Rock. Oh, Dwayne the Johnson. The yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about yes. <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And then last weekend, last weekend I saw Jurassic Park 3D, which yes. was good. But yes. Okay, what? 3D is terrible. 3D is the worst. You're terrible. Film since the beginning of time. You're terrible. Yep, that's why D Wang walks around with one eye closed all the time. <laughs> no, You're terrible, D Wang. Movies are just terrible. 3D movies are so much worse than their regular counterparts. That's wrong and just wrong. No, 3D versions of movies are absolutely awful. Like, everything is smaller and everything looks really tiny. Anything with movement looks really bad because, like, the weird thing with the eyes and stuff makes everything look really jittery. Um, I think your eyes are probably just broken, D. Wang. No, it's just. Terrible. I don't have any of those problems watching 3D movies. 3D movies look really stupid to me in every way. Are you guys all watching Game of Thrones? Yep. Got to keep up with that. I'm not up to date at all, so... What? 
Yep, day. I'm watching, like, I'm on, like, season two, episode two or something. It's probably good, because then you won't be, like, waiting for the next episode and all that. Halfway we're there. Yeah. All right, let's give them all the spoilers. Uh, Ned Stark dies in season one. Well, I didn't hear you there at all. All right, good. You know what's terrible? You? You? I really hate that Sean Bean's name doesn't rhyme because it really looks like it should. <laughs> John Bon. No, it should be. It looks like Seam Bean. John Bon, man. God damn it. I'm Tommy Lambert and I'm squeezing oranges. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> that, that, that was very an old strange joke. inside jokes. Yeah. That was, good days. Good days. You don't make sense. You're not it, making any sense, man. Wait, Gates, have you heard all my music yet? No. <laughs> no, fuck. You should probably hear the Tommy one. Um, let me find it. I, I have music. I don't know oh. what's happening. Is this the Tommy, or... you're, it's called the Lambert Wiggle. Oh, uh, yeah, that one. <laughs> the hell? You all are weird. What? You all are weird. You have no idea. All right, listen to this. Oh, I have to click. You rang every since this down. Wiggle, 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 Brain is, uh, Gates is going to have a brain meltdown. <laughs> cool. What the fuck, dude? <laughs> well, they just listen to the bees song. I can give you the source code for that music. No. I think I'm okay. <laughs> I'll be okay without it. Jesus, I didn't make the B song. Yeah, but it is incredibly hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that was what we were going for. I guess so. <laughs> it's a masterpiece of strangeness. What other... I don't think I have anything else that's that hilarious in my music collection. It was like an equal temperament weird one, right? That was nice and you weren't there. Well, no, that's weird. It's not. That's like a music weirdness. And for some reason, it's not in my folder. Have to create a new one. It's called Vague Scribbling of a Saturnian. I found it. Is it Titus making noises? What is that? It's a Titus. The Titus likes to make noises. When you plug something into the Titus, it makes noises. Uh, what is it? Wait, what do you plug into the Titus? Bananas. You plug bananas into the Titus. Okay, hell. Do you guys think that bananas are better? When they're a little bit green, perfectly yellow, or with some brown spots on it, or something else. You still a little, little, bit green, little bit green to perfectly yellow. Yes, a little brown spot. It's yes. Thank you. Green bananas are the best. What? I mean, not that they're so green that they're just like an unripe. Well, yeah. There's a point where they're unripe that if you take a bite of it. 
Like it'll like it's chunky. It's a chalk. Yeah. A little bit of a green that has a little, a little bit of tartness still to it. That's perfect. When it gets like overly sweet, that's terrible. Oh, that's great. You make banana bread. Best thing ever. Well, sure. No, they're good to make it like that, but I'm not going to eat a banana straight up when it's that sweet. Well, you have, I recall you have weird attitudes about bananas anyway, so. Yeah, we've discussed this many a time. No, yeah. this, is, this is perfectly reasonable. I have some people who agree with me in every way. <laughs> One yeah, other person on the planet man. believes in me. I must be right. Correct. Anyway, the TARDIS is actually a USB hub, so you plug okay. USB things into it, and it makes noises. Oh, Not man. a banana, right? Not a banana. It'd be hard-pressed to fit a banana in a USB hub. I have triple dog dare you. Well, in that case, I don't have any bananas. Oh. If you mail me a banana, I will try to put it in the USB hub. Alright, I'll just like Sharpie Gates on and your dress on a banana and see if I can deliver it. I won't oh, wrap it. I don't what he says said. That would be actually hilarious. And I would like to see if that actually happens. I don't think they would ship it. Alright, I'm gonna mail this to Gates. <laughs> that will fit. That will fit. And <laughs> why are you so obsessed with bananas? I not really. I just think banana is a funny word. Well, you've been thinking that for a while now. Yeah. Really and it hasn't stopped being a funny word. Yeah, we could write poetry again in the chat. We could. Have any new poem ideas? I've been pondering recently. <laughs> That's my poem. It's, that was really beautiful. I thought so. Tommy, you kind of you kind of broke it a little bit. Yeah, you messed with the flow a little bit. That's right. He said, oh my god, it animated. What the fuck? <laughs> oh, I figured I animated to this. Oh, oops. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> what the hell is that? Oh, Gotta oh, rock out. Yeah, it's all rocking out. Wait, it's it not doing? rocking out. <laughs> the LMO? It looks like a guy sticking up his hands. Don't shoot. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you guys doing? <laughs> Got it. Good job, uh, Tommy. Hmm. All right, Tommy, tell us a story. Uh, once upon a time, there was. Oh, what a goat! A goat! A goat! A goat with and no. He was on a mountain, grazing. No, he, had, he had no. He had no. Uh, orange. He had only one horn. And he was trying to fight another goat. Over the the goat love female goat. We'll call her that. He lost because he only went home. The end. <laughs> that was a beautiful story. That was really terrible, Tommy. <laughs> wow, why do you have to be so negative all the time, D? Yeah, well, no, it's, it's well, yeah, it's constructive terrible. criticism. Come on. It, it's terrible, but I think it should be more terrible. I'm looking for a terrible story. And uh, I'm saying it was terrible, which is a good thing. You have to give me an example, and then I'll try again. Here we go. Go, go. Example. Yeah, we need a war story. Yeah, war story. From you. you example. I need an example. From me? Yeah. yeah. Constructive criticism. You can't just say.
say it was wrong. Yeah, I need to know how I'm scaling up against my peers. You're my peers. Meaningful feedback. Tell me a story about scuba diving. Scuba diving. In the Antarctic. Well, I don't think I can actually say it out loud. Uh, it's going to be written. Ewing has weird standards for his stories. I guess it is a little bit worse if you write it instead of saying it, so... I know Journey for the worst story possible. It's a good plan. There we go, that was pretty good. I like the twist, halfway through. That caught me off guard. Correct. <laughs> All right. So is this like story competition time? I guess so. It's a story off. Who's next? So someone else needs to give a person a subject to tell a story about, and then the other yeah. person gives. All right. It's my turn. I have to give someone else a subject. Who thinks they can challenge my story? I think you should assign a person to write the story as well. All right. That sounds like Gates. This is your turn to write a story, and you're going to write it about it, about a lonely chair in the middle of Alaska. Wait, who did you say? Was that me? Yeah, Jesus. A lonely chair in the middle of Alaska. <laughs> All right. I guess you should have length similar to the other stories. You don't have to write it. You can also well, speak your no, way through it. You know, you can just keep telling it if you want, or you can just not tell it at all. Or tell it a negative length, and I don't actually know what that means. No, it doesn't mean anything. No, that's good. In fact, I just did it. There was a negative length story. You probably missed it, and it was quite good. Hey, that was the worst thing this job had ever. <laughs> Do it again. You are the one that delivered it. I want to hear a story about a sad chair. All right, let's see. A lonely chair in the middle of Alaska. Yeah, that. Once upon a time, in the cold, vast forests of northern Juneau, there was a whittling bear who had studied humans and their whittling ways and tired of seating himself upon rocks and the ground and lying in streams and had stolen a knife from a hunter who he mauled horribly but also been injured himself and he needed to rest and recover. So he found the biggest oak tree he could and took his tiny knife and stabbed at it and cut and felled it down and whittled himself a seat. And it was vast and bowl-like. He put his mass into the seat. But then he succumbed to his wounds and fell out of the seat and into the river and was washed away forever. But the chair remembered him and the love that the bear had given to the chair. And the bear was no more and the chair sat and it couldn't move and it had no friends and the snow fell on it and buried it and it rotted away and the chair was sad forevermore. Yeah. That was so good. Yeah. <laughs> How do you do that? What? It was an excellent prompt. I give all credit to you, Ryan. <laughs> Hello! Hi, I haven't seen you on here. I've been pretty bad at making these things. I also didn't know that like your little box on top. What are you doing? Uh, the computer is heavy. <laughs> Just put it on. All right. <laughs> it's really heavy. All right, Jesus, you have to give a prompt to somebody. All right, Jesus, prompt somebody. All right, let's go down the line to Gates. Okay, I think I'm going to go. I want to hear this now. Oh, no, 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 no. You haven't told the story yet. Yeah. You can you know, I go before he starts, because then I'm not, I don't even know what I'm going to miss. Okay. I'm sorry. Good night. I'm sure your story will be beautiful. 
You can it will be the most the magnificent story anyone has ever heard. I will be missing it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, let's see. Gates will tell a story about a tailor who has to clothe the fattest man he has ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> a tailor who has to clothe the fattest man he has ever seen. Okay, I think I can do this. <sighs> so you want to talk about challenges, do you? Well... I'll tell you a challenge. I'll tell you the most difficult thing I ever had to do in my life. Now, some of you may know that I am a tailor. Some others may know I am the world's most renowned tailor. I have clothed kings and emperors and princesses and presidents. People from all around seek me for my very talented tailoring skills. One day, while minding my tailoring store, a customer came in. Upon hearing the bell ring, I look up at the door and am taken aback in utter shock. For standing, barely making his way through the doorway, comes the most rotund, the largest, the most obese human being I have ever seen. Now, you may think you've seen some fat people, but let me tell you, take the two fattest people you've ever seen, tape them together, back to back. That doesn't even come close. This man, upon opening my door and squeezing through, bellows in the deepest, fattest voice, I'm here for a suit. Now, I have a pretty keen tailoring eye, and I could tell that this would be one hell of a job. I was ready to turn him away. I said, well, sir, I would love to help you, of course, but I just I don't believe I have material suited this. I will pay you handsomely. So I don't, sir, you must understand, I have tailored for emperors and kings and princesses and presidents. And he said, I will pay you more than any of them have, for I am a wealthy man, perhaps the wealthiest man in the world. If you were to take all my money and stack it on top of each other, it would reach to Pluto and back. <laughs> that is how many dollars I have. And how many? And a portion of that I am willing to pay to you for a fine suit. So I start to tailor this man's suit. How can I say no to enough money that reaches Pluto and back? I take out my measuring tape, and then I realize I need to take out another measuring tape. Five more, and I staple them together and start to take measurements. It's, it's difficult. And it's very difficult. <laughs> I have to go around and under and I can't hold my arm and take the measurement the other way because this man is grossly, grossly fat. So finally, 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 it comes in. And I, or I get the measurements done, and I'm ready to send him on his way and tell him that in a few weeks there will be a fitting ready. Of course, I tell him there's going to be a premium given how much extra material I have to use. It's basically going to take all the material in my store. I have to special order yards of the stuff, which of course I do because he has enough money to make it to Pluto and back. Comes in for the fitting, takes some more measurements, see how everything fits. Gonna have to make some changes. He seems to have gotten even fatter. I don't know how he did it in three weeks, but 
The man found a way. So I sent him back on his way. Tell him I will let him know when the suit is done, the final alterations. I finished them, got everything ready, and it's a magnificent suit. Granted, it, you know, could carpet an apartment of a decent size, but it's still a nice suit. And it would look fantastic on this map. And he comes back in for the final fitting, and I have it hanging up on, ready for him to approve, try on. He goes into the, uh, the fitting room, puts it all on, pauses for, for a long time, quite a long time, and finally comes out with a very disgruntled expression on his face. Uh, he looks at me, wearing this, or holding the suit up in his hand, and he just, he's very apologetic, very sorry, but he just says, looks at me and says, I'm sorry, I just don't like the color. And with that, he leaves, and I never see a man that fat again. Oh, good. The also, end. that put like Jesus, like, death. Very nice, Gates. <laughs> well, I guess we know what our next collaborative story is about. Very good questions, doing the hardest things they could ever done. <laughs> That's true. That would be a good story. It'd, like, it'd be like Canterbury Tales, and everyone uh, is telling the hardest story they've ever done. <laughs> that would work well for the collaborative aspect, too, because <laughs> you don't have to worry about advancing any plot other than your own. <laughs> Do that. I was trying to decide if I want to have a really strong overarching plot or a really weak one. <laughs> well, I was thinking I'd try doing a really strong one and seeing how that would work out. That would be interesting. Because the one we did before had a pretty weak one overall. It would require people to take it a little bit more seriously. You couldn't just derail your yeah. story for 500 words and then go back <laughs> to the thing again. All right, Gates, who's writing the next story? All right. Well, everyone's told a story now. Hmm. Should I just continue the circle, go back to Tommy? Do whatever you want. Makes sense. All right. Tommy has to tell a story, and he has to tell a story about a two software programs living in a computer. Ouch. That's tricky. Come on, Tommy, where's the story? Hold on, hold on, one second. You think I'm too. This is gonna be terrible. But let's see here. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> make the worst story you can possibly make. The hero of our story will be a little man named Bite. Who little does he know is actually in he is a basically uh, a character in a bigger role of things. He didn't realize that he was actually in a computer program. What he also didn't know. Can you guys hear me, by the way? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. What he also didn't know was there was another computer program that was actually consuming this computer program as he spoke. So Byte was looking around, and then one day the world collapsed in on himself, and he was found in another computer program. I actually don't know where this is going. I give up. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> You're supposed to figure it out as you tell it. That's yeah. I need more practice. <laughs> I'm not sure if that counted, but I'm going to say it counted. <laughs> uh, it was an effort. Effort hey. counts. I'm going to break the circle and pick Jesus as the next one. <laughs> oh, man. If that's all right with uh, everyone. Yep. Unacceptable. Pick whoever you like. All right. Now let's think of a good topic here. I would like you to tell a story of a lonely meteor hurling through space 
hoping to be saved by its hero, which you can decide who that is. Hoping to be saved by its hero? Yep. Ah. Saved from what? It doesn't matter. You can make that up, too. Let's see. Have you ever been out to sea on the lonely ocean, perhaps crossing from one continent to another, and witnessed the vast expanse of nothing, rolling waves, and lonely clouds, and clung on to your companions, for they were all you had and all you could hope to have? There's worse than that. I've lived it, and there were many years for which I could not escape. Before then, I was part of a collective. I had a purpose, grand scheme of things, a planet that sustained life, and I was a part of it. The little critters walked on my surface, the plants and their roots grew deep into me, but then, then the comet came and struck our planet and cleaved it in twain, and pieces flew, and I was separated from my fellows and flung out into the deep abyss of space. And so I traveled without purpose. The only light is far away and fleeting, twinkling stars it signified nothing to me. And there was coldness, a deeper cold than I would thought was possible, where every one of my particles would cease to move and lay static, and without even sense of motion, as if I were hung fixedly in the firmament, for all eternity, but even as I began to forget of the days when there was love and togetherness, I still had hope that one day I might be again with others. And so, after many years, I came upon a galaxy, fresh, new, swirling and twinkling. And though I called out, I could not be heard, for the darkness swallowed up my voice. And the casting comets that I saw also had forgotten how to speak, when told over millennia. But I still had hope, still could see the possibilities, and I Inches, just inches at a time, corrected my course towards the light I could see, towards the heroic planets that drew me in with their gravity. And hundreds of years in the making, I found myself on a course towards what I had always dreamed of, another planet, verdant, and lush with life and streams, atmosphere, hurtling closer and closer, faster and faster as its gravity well drew me in with open arms. And I screamed at it, I love you. And we crashed and it exploded and I was flung into space anew. And all my hopes were dashed and now I sit flying again knowing that my fate is this forever, to be the destroyer of life, as he who had destroyed life originally was to me. The end. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good also. Where was the hero? The hero, I don't know. I figured the planet, planet. he crashed into was kind of the hero. It didn't really work in.
Our stories have started becoming actually good. <laughs> Not terrible stories that we're telling. Uh, I'll bring us back to our roots. No, no, I like this new direction we're going now, in. Now, me and D-Wang are keeping us grounded, and you guys are, like, competing for best story. <laughs> I'm going to have to leave soon, by the way, about ten minutes. But Jesus doesn't have to pick D-Wang, he picked D-Wang. No, we got to pick D-Wang, we can't then, leave D-Wang out. Has to go on. No, I mean, like, we are all going to go, but you can pick the order. What? What? It's going to be Gates and then D-Wang, or D-Wang then Gates. So you just get to pick the order. Let's flip a coin. No, let's have D-Wang next. And um, sort of story should we have? <coughs> hmm, let's see. Let's have a story about... A, a benevolent god who is frustrated by the way the people he has created keep screwing up his good intentions. A benevolent god who looks down upon his creation and realizes that they're what his, huh? Go on. What? Yes. Yes. And that was a question. <laughs> oh, you, the prompt of the story is a benevolent god has oh. to deal with the fact that his creation keeps fucking shit up. Oh, they're fucking shit up. Okay, yeah, he's trying to be benevolent, but they're just too big of a fuck up for it to really work out. Steve sighed and looked down upon his brethren, the ones he created with the dirt of the own earth that he stood upon, which he also created out of the dirt from the other earth that he had to destroy, for he was a benevolent god who destroyed worlds and created others. He stared down upon at the surface, at the little mites running around, throwing little sticks at each other and making each other fall over in fear and blood and glory. And they were terrible, he thought. Oh my, what did I rot upon this universe? I should have destroyed this world long ago and created a third one because I'm a benevolent god. And as he sighed, the gust of wind and emanating from his mouth did wipe the humanity free of the planet Earth. And they watched as the dirt floated away and they suffocated in the cold vacuum of space. Ah, said Steve. Well, that about fixes it. As he swam away through space after the dirt, he watched as it slowly formed into yet a third planet in which he hoped he would not have to wipe them out yet again. Because he was benevolent and stuff. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Yeah. He seems a little bit more self deluded than benevolent. No, yeah, he didn't, benevolent. didn't really follow the prompt. It was supposed to be the creations that screwed it up. <laughs> they did God. screw it up. They're throwing sticks at each other. He hated <laughs> that. Sticks so love. God, nothing is worse than when someone throws a stick at someone else. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, everyone this, has their your own creative rights to the story. That was a good story. <laughs> you right, have to give me some now. Well, and everybody knows that sticks and stones break bones. You gotta watch out. It's true. Last story. Yeah. Um, Gates, the prompt is a terrified roll of toilet paper lost in a tree. A terrified roll of toilet paper lost in a tree. Terrified because he's lost in a tree. Not like just like high up. He's just totally lost, but also in a tree. Okay. Okay. Oh, and everybody in the story is French. <laughs> Including the toilet paper. Correct. Les toilettes. Viens des toilettes.
Oh, this is the paper to the toilet. My God. My God, help me! Screams the toilet paper. Loudly, although nobody could hear him. No, from high up in the tree. My God! He's terribly up here! I cannot see the ground! I cannot see the sky! I cannot see the other people! He roared the toilet paper, desperate, desperate for any assistance. And yet none came, for he was far, far too lost, deep in the bowels of this tree, <laughs> wrapped around branches, with leaves poking through, individual toilet paper squares, the roll falling long down a knot hole and being and been turned into a nest of a squirrel. But before we examine the toilet paper's current predicament, maybe we should look at how it got here. This toilet paper was not any exceptional roll. It was entirely average, factory approved, wrapped in a six pack and bought from a store shelf. You wouldn't have been surprised to see this toilet paper in a supermarket or someone's daily shopping or even in a bathroom. This toilet paper had five other brethren in its toilet paper package, all of whom were pulled out before it attached to the toilet paper roll thingamajigger and used up as time went by. This particular roll of toilet paper upon the final square of his last brother being flushed away was removed from the cabinet beneath the sink taken and with the little toilet paper roll thingy to hold it to the wall put through the cardboard tube, about ready to accept its fate as the last of this pack of brothers used to clean the rear ends of humanity. And it was then that from the open window a bird, large and terrifying, flew into the bathroom, grabbing the toilet paper in its sharp talons as it screamed in terror and fear my god what is this bird where did it come from <laughs> the two of them flew toilet paper screaming at the top of its lungs panicking doing everything it can to escape which being a roll of toilet paper was not much and the bird just doing birdie things carrying some toilet paper. Who knows what the bird wanted the toilet paper for? It just wanted it. But a sad day for both toilet paper and bird came when the bird lost its grip. Down, 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 down to the clouds and sky fell the toilet paper till finally it landed in a tree. One of the end of the roll getting caught on a branch as it continued to fall, unwinding all the way. Wind blowing it back over other branches, tangling it until it was as much a part of the tree as the leaves and the bark. And that is how we find our roll of toilet paper today. Tangled. For help the end. Okay. Hey, toilet paper. He never got a resolution. His resolution is to be forever trapped in a world of terror. Yeah. <laughs> it's a roll of toilet paper in a tree. It's not going to escape. <laughs> well, man. Okay, I need to leave now or I will be stranded at Google. It will be very sad. What? Just stay here forever. Just like infinite food and shit. Like sleep in a nap pod. That's cool. That's probably that too. Play board games on Friday before you leave. Uh, yeah, maybe. I'll talk to Alex. Okay.
Because if you don't, then I'm not going, then D Wang's right, and I'll have to drink the beer I brought myself. That would be very sad. Okay. Okay. That's all. Good story, Tom's folks. Doodles. Doodles.